Thank you, Shira, for this great interview. We move now to a panel on the future of Lebanon. Over the years, Lebanon has had more than its fair share of misery. But it seems like the last two years have been the worst. Political deadlock, economic crisis, poor governance, a terrible blast in Beirut, and of course, the ongoing COVID pandemic. All these have created a terrible situation for the Lebanese population. The international community has been largely absent, leaving Lebanon to deal on its own with its problems. In this panel, we will try to see if Lebanon can rise from its crisis, if, it, if there is some way in which Lebanon can solve its problems. We are joined by highly knowledgeable uh, panelists. Uh, the first panelist is Tony Badran, a research fellow from the Foundation for Defense of Democracies in Washington, the FDD. Born and raised in Lebanon, he follows very closely the situation there. Our second panelist will be Hagai Etkes, an economist. Um, before joining INSS as a senior fellow, he worked at the Bank of Israel, and he will address the economic situation in Lebanon. Our third panelist is Orna Mizrahi, who served as the Deputy National Security Advisor for Foreign Policy before joining the INSS as a senior fellow. She's in charge of the Lebanon file at INSS, and she initiated this important um, panel. Um, we'll start with Tony. How would you describe the current situation in Lebanon? Well, good, good morning from the U.S. Uh, to you all, and uh, I uh, thank you for having me today. Um, uh, the way I would describe what has been happening for the last two years in Lebanon is a conditioning process on the part of the uh, ruling uh, oligarchy, uh, basically, or the, the, the sectarian consortium uh, uh, in, in Lebanon, which is dominated by uh, Hezbollah uh, in its totality. Uh, after the rise of um, the popular movement in October, um, uh, two years ago, um, um, the October movement, there was a lot of uh, feeling in, you know, both in Lebanon and abroad that this actually is a movement uh, to change the system. What has happened is actually the opposite. Uh, what has happened is that the Pillars of the system have conditioned the population to basically accept uh, all their losses and uh, redistribute their losses uh, and to basically not challenge uh, the status quo. And that's what you see. So on the part of the population, there is a complete resignation to their, to their situation and those who can leave uh, have left. Uh, so you have in that sense the end of the post-Civil uh, War uh, lie that had uh, basically dominated Lebanon for, uh, since 1990. And the lie was that there, after the Civil War, uh, you can come in and rebuild Lebanon and, and start something new. And this was how the sectarian leaders uh, attracted uh, the expats of the, the Lebanese who had left during the war, as well as their capital. And that uh, meant that there was a constant influx of foreign currency into the, into the country, along with the aspirations that soon became complicity on the part of these expats in basically sustaining their status quo, the status quo of the system. Uh, until it all fell apart. A next lie is now going to be reborn uh, with the complicity, of course, of the uh, international community, what's so-called the international community, the United States, France, and so on, uh, in order to basically sustain the, the, the new uh, status quo, which is actually what has been the reality that people have been trying to ignore for the last 20, 30 years, which is that the Lebanese uh, political system and the social makeup, its demographic, uh, the, the, the pillars of its strength, uh, or rather the pillar of power in it, within that system, belong to Hezbollah and to the, and to the Shia community. Some countries abroad, have, like France, have completely come to terms with this and have offered explicit partnership with Hezbollah in Lebanon as the new ruler of the, of the domain. Uh, the United States plays a more coy uh, game, uh, but with the same result. It just does it indirectly. 
uh, it does it by um, elevating a fiction that there is something called a state in Lebanon with institutions. Uh, and this way, it can indirectly sustain a system that is run by Hezbollah. Uh, but now, I think that's the trajectory of where we're going, sort of the end of uh, a phase of the post-Civil War and post-Syrian withdrawal in 2005. Uh, its collapse, conditioning of the population to accept the collapse and, uh, and accommodate themselves to it, whether by leaving or by staying, uh, and also an accommodation or conditioning of the international community to this new reality, uh, which, uh, like I said, uh, the, both the United States and France appear to be willing participants. The one change is that unlike what had happened in the, uh, the post-Civil War era, uh, Saudi Arabia has decided that it does not want any part of this uh, of this game. So Saudi Arabia has cut its losses, and uh, you know told the Lebanese best of luck and uh, moved on. Uh, so I think that if there's any change from what we had seen in the past uh, of how this scenario unfolds, is that uh, the, despite tremendous pressure from the United States and France, uh, the Saudis have said enough is enough. Thank you for this. Uh, Haggai, uh, we know the economic situation in Lebanon is very bad. Uh, what are the Lebanon's main economic problems? The problem started with, uh, with the relatively low uh, exchange rate, uh, uh, foreign exchange reserves. In order to uh, sustain the influx of uh, foreign exchange and foreign currency, uh, they engage in some sort of financial engineering. So in addition to what Tony described as the political atmosphere, there was also an economic incentive to uh, send money to uh, Lebanon. Uh, and actually, Lebanon, uh, Lebanese banks gave higher interest rates on deposits of uh, foreign, of foreign currency uh, than uh, investors could have got in other places. Uh, as a result, <clears throat> Uh, and this was particularly uh, true in the environment of the low interest rate uh, in the last decade. Uh, since the outbreak of uh, COVID uh, and uh, the decline of uh, tourism and the decline of arrival of uh, expats to Lebanon, we see a decline in the reserves of a foreign currency in uh, Lebanon. And uh, Lebanon tried to fix it uh, very quickly after it got uh, an allocation of SDR an asset by the IMF, and they uh, sold the SDRs in exchange for uh, foreign currencies to bolster the situation. This is part of the problem. The other part, the, uh, as a result of this financial engineering, the uh, financial system is basically bankrupt, and there are a lot of losses, and there is a need to decide how to distribute the losses between various actors. And actually, Tony uh, mentioned it, that the elite wants to uh, make, uh, to make the population to uh, bear the burden of the losses rather than uh, the elite themselves. And uh, it's also related to the situation of the central bank that uh, its situation is unclear. The international community, including the IMF, pushed the uh, central bank uh, to undergo an audit. They're doing some sort of audit, but now it's not clear whether this audit is moving forward, how uh, well it will be done. And the last thing is the, the fiscal situation. Uh, in order for a state to operate, it needs to control its borders and ports and so on and be able to collect taxes. And this is not the situation in Lebanon. There are a lot of fiscal leakages, both in tax collection and also in tax spending. Uh, some of the spendings are not going uh, to the right directions. Uh, they are embezzled by various groups. And this will uh, be also a challenge uh, for the donors how to provide aid to Lebanon without uh, allowing uh, these funds to be embezzled by various actors. Thank you for that. Uh, Orna, how does the dire situation in Lebanon affect Israel? Well, I will start by saying that it's affecting Israel. It is, it is affecting Israel now and it's going to affect Israel in the future. And I think that it is a very important issue for us that we have to deal with it. We can't neglect it. We can't push it aside and say it's not our business. I think that what is going on in Lebanon is our business and we have to do something uh, uh, about it, at least to deal with it and uh, uh, formulate some kind of strategy 
of how we are dealing with uh, uh, this issue. And we can't continue to be focused only on the military uh, threat uh, uh, to Israel by Hezbollah. We have to see what's going on in Lebanon because it's connected. And the threat from Hezbollah is connected with what is uh, going on in uh, Lebanon. Now, I know that not everyone in Israel agrees with me. And I think that even Tony, I'm not sure that he agrees with me that there is something to do about what's going on in uh, Lebanon. I think that uh, uh, Lebanon is not yet controlled uh, uh, completely by uh, Hezbollah, and it, there is something uh, to do. In Israel, there are uh, two main approaches toward this issue. There are some that are saying that it's a uh, uh, fait accompli. Lebanon is under the, uh, the occupation, even occupation of Iran. Uh, uh, Hezbollah is uh, leading and uh, deciding about everything that's happening in Lebanon. Uh, we call it Hezbollah state. Uh, and uh, I even heard some voices in Israel that are calling it Hezbollahstan. I think that it's not the real reality uh, that uh, we are witnessing. It's the way that you are looking at it. There are two reasons that they are, they are bringing and saying that why it's, uh, 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 Israel has uh, nothing to do with it. The first one is that, uh, that it, there is nothing to do because it's fait accompli and uh, you can do nothing about Lebanon. The second one is maybe the situation, but the deterioration of the situation, the inside situation in Lebanon is good for Israel and is playing in favor of Israel because uh, now um, Hezbollah is uh, dealing more with what's happening inside Lebanon and is uh, less free to act against Israel and invest in confrontation with Israel. Uh, I think that it's, it's, it's not the, the reality because I think that maybe today he is busy with what's going on inside uh, Lebanon, but we are going to have a greater problem uh, uh, in the future and we don't have the privilege to as I said before, to put it aside and not deal with it. So if we will elaborate this issue a little bit, so uh, how can the situation in Lebanon uh, improve and how can Israel uh, assist Lebanon or assist the international community in assisting Lebanon? So, um, Galia, I'm not naive. Uh, I'm a little bit optimistic, but I'm not naive. And I know that it is going to be very uh, uh, difficult uh, uh, to, uh, to improve something in uh, the devastating situation uh, uh, in Lebanon. But I think that we have to try to do uh, something. Not we Israelis, because Israel cannot do a lot by itself. They, don't, uh, they ignore us when we uh, offer our uh, help. Um, they see us as an enemy uh, state. Um, but I think that Israel can do by um, uh, uh, joining or uh, motivating the, uh, our partners in the international community. I'm, I'm talking on the same uh, partners, it's uh, United States, uh, France, and also the partners in the Gulf. Uh, the, uh, our new partners in the Gulf, and the, the Saudis through the Americans, to create some kind of, of, of coalition that maybe can do something uh, to change the situation in Lebanon. I know that uh, we need uh, uh, billions of, of, uh, of dollars to help uh, Lebanon, and there is, there is a need to a profound change in the system of Lebanon, the economic system, the political system. And it can be, uh, we, we cannot do a lot in the, in the near future. But I think that at least we can stop the deterioration of the situation. Um, so in our um, uh, annual assessment that was just published uh, last uh, week, uh, our recommendation was uh, uh, to the decision makers in Israel that to motivate, to, to act with our friends and to motivate them to uh, do something. Uh, we are talking about the need of a common strategy and uh, the need of, uh, uh, that this strategy will be dual, will include dual policy. On one side, to help the, the voices in Lebanon that are the, the anti-Hezbollah uh, camp, because there is an anti-Hezbollah camp in Lebanon. There are voices, parties, and, and these voices are becoming more and more loud about uh, the fact that uh, Hezbollah is the problem of Lebanon, about the fact that they don't like that what Hezbollah is doing with Israel. 
they don't like the influence of Iran. So we have to, to see how we help these voices. The anti-Hezbollah camp now in Lebanon is very weak, but maybe we can do something to strengthen them. And uh, the, the, other, uh, the other thing, on the other hand, we, what is needed is to continue with the pressure on Hezbollah, to continue by all means, military, economy, political, uh, cognitive warfare. Uh, as we are doing for a few years, we have to continue with that and to try to change the balance uh, between, inside Lebanon between the pro-Hezbollah and the anti-Hezbollah uh, section and in the region between uh, Iran, uh, the Iranian influence and the uh, Western and uh, Gulf uh, and the moderate Arab uh, countries influence uh, in Lebanon. Because I think that Israel's interest is that Lebanon will be stable, uh, uh, prosperous, and uh, because chaos in Lebanon is, go is bad for Israel. We have seen in the last year that uh, because of the deterioration in the situation, that Hamas could have some, uh, be stronger in the uh, south of Lebanon and even uh, started to fire rockets again against uh, Israel. So the chaos is no good for us. And we have to think about ways to, to change, uh, uh, to change the, the, the reality. Thank you. Uh, Tony, um, do you think Hezbollah will allow the creation of the conditions for an improvement in the economic situation in Lebanon, in the political situation in Lebanon? Uh, I think Hezbollah has no problem with uh, an improved economic situation. Uh, you see, uh, un the, the conventional wisdom has it that the outside aid to Lebanon somehow is bad for Hezbollah or counters Hezbollah or uh, upsets Hezbollah. It does not. Hezbollah is more than happy with external aid. In fact, Hezbollah encourages external aid, encourages external aid to, uh, to the Lebanese army, to the economy. It has absolutely no problem with that. Uh, um, the issue in the past has not been that of aid. It has been that now, I mean, today it's been whether that aid requires systemic reform. And in that case, it's not really just Hezbollah that's uh, uh, blocking systemic reform. It's everyone because Lebanon is not a real state, okay? It's, uh, it's a money laundering headquarters. It's, uh, uh, its entire banking system is completely uh, uh, enmeshed with Hezbollah illicit activity and others, starting from the central bank all the way to the smallest bank that got sanctioned by the United States, you know, in 2019, Jamal Trust Bank, for instance, very small bank. So, I mean, you look at the al Qaeda al-Hassan uh, financial institutions, uh, the records that came out of it, and you see, I mean, every Lebanese bank is part of it, and, and, and that's it, because that's what, what, when we say Lebanese economy, okay, economy, the Lebanese economy is money laundering. That's what it's been in from, from you know, from the 60s. It's not, um, it's not a real place. Um, the Hezbo Hezbollah has no problem with aid. Uh, uh, Hezbollah has no problem with, you know, um, Saudis putting money into uh, Saad Hariri because Saad Hariri was a junior partner for Hezbollah. No problem. Uh, no, it has no problem with the United States putting money in the uh, Lebanese armed forces because that means now the United States is more invested in Lebanon and has uh, and now uh, is looking to micromanage some of its uh, basic day-to-day uh, -day operations. I mean, you look at the ambassador in Lebanon, and she's acting like she's the director of Electricité du Liban or Amos Hofstein, you know, coming and he wants to, you know, br you know run their uh, energy sector. And, I mean, it, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of ridiculous, but Hezbollah has no problem with any of it. So uh, the issue then, again, is whether how the outside world decides to, uh, to, uh, to work and cooperate with these parameters, uh, for, for meaning no systemic reform. You deal with what is. And what is, is whatever has been there forever, and now with Hezbollah at, at the helm. Uh, Emmanuel Macron, for instance, has said, yes, absolutely. I am here to deal with Hezbollah, no problem. That's uh, French realism. And so, no problem. So, uh, uh, and I mentioned that the United States is doing it 
uh, through the illusion or at least the uh, stated uh, objective that somehow this is going to counter Hezbollah. But in fact, they're just stabilizing the situation, which means uh, stabilizing the Hezbollah-run order. Um, so uh, stability, which Orna just mentioned, is not a problem for any of these actors, Hezbollah included. They have no problem with stability under Hezbollah. No problem. And, and the Hamas thing is an example. Hamas, I mean, you know, we haven't heard of that for in a long time. It happened very specifically within an Iranian context because it was Hezbollah managed. It wasn't against Hezbollah. It was Hezbollah managed. So the idea of uh, chaos in Lebanon is also a questionable proposal. Uh, I'm not quite sure, you know, a lot of people talk about, oh, the, you know, the, the civil, we can have a return to the civil war. I don't know. I don't know if that's actually true. I don't even know if chaos in the sense that we understand it, like, for instance, you know, um, like uh, a Somalia scenario, which a lot of people talk about, or an Afghanistan scenario. I don't think that's true either. I think, uh, you know, the there could be violence in Lebanon. Of course, there could be violence, but there are multiple levels of violence. There are different types of violence. Is this violence that can actually shake uh, the foundation of the system as it is? I'm very doubtful, at least for the foreseeable future, uh, spe specifically as it pertains to Israeli security. The threat to Israeli security from Lebanon is only from Hezbollah. It's not from anything having to do with, uh, you know, some, some form of other violent actors coming in. If they do come in, it will be under Hezbollah and Iranian management, not against it. Thank you. Um, Chagai, if you were the head of the Lebanon portfolio in the IMF, what would be your recommendations for the international community, for the regional actors? How can they assist Lebanon? Well, okay, so actually last Monday the negotiations between the IMF and Lebanon were resumed. Uh, so it's a timely question. Um, I think uh, the uh, international, gov international community, including uh, the IMF, uh, should uh, set very clear conditions uh, to Lebanon in order to uh, get an aid by the IMF and, uh, and the other actors and be able to uh, reform its economic and uh, in a way also it's implicitly it's a political system. Um, so first of all, uh, the need uh, to address what Tony mentioned, the, the money laundering uh, system and do audit to the whole financial sector, starting with the central bank. The central bank of, of Lebanon has awkward set of uh, assets, including the uh, national airways, uh, Middle Eastern airways, and a casino and other things. Not many central banks have these kind of assets. They have other kind of assets and liabilities. All these issues should be clear, uh, should be evaluated, audited, and we should know, the international, com international community should know whether this bank is, is, has any positive assets at all. The same thing uh, goes for the commercial as uh, banks. All the commercial banks should go through audit to see whether they're underwater or above the water, and debt of the financial system should be restructured, and the debt should be the losses should be allocated to relevant actors, not only to the uh, weaker uh, population. On the fiscal side, uh, Lebanon should be able to uh, strengthen. It's uh, fiscal manage management starting with true collection of taxes from all economic actors in Lebanon and also be able to uh, spend uh, money in a reasonable way without significant uh, fiscal leakages. And this is, again, goes back to the donors. Uh, when, if and when they'll provide aid to uh, Lebanon, they should make sure that as little as possible is being, uh, of these, this aid will leak uh, outside uh, of its intended uh, uh, targets. And we have a recent study uh, dealing not only with Lebanon but with aid in general that significant part of the aid is going to tax havens after aid is uh, being given to uh, a country. So I think this uh, fear is particularly uh, acute in the case of uh, Lebanon. And the last thing is uh, being able to bolster their uh, foreign exchange, their foreign currency, uh, reserves, 
without doing financial engineering or, or providing uh, too generous tax havens for uh, foreign uh, investors. So they will not uh, start this game altogether. Thank you. Uh, we are approaching the end of the panel. Uh, Orna, uh, looking ahead, a few years ahead, how do you see the future of Lebanon? Well, it's very difficult to see the future of Lebanon, but we always think about few scenarios that can uh, happen, and most of them are not so good, because uh, as I see it, it's very difficult to change the situation if nobody intervenes from outside. Uh, anyway, uh, it, it, one scenario is that there is going to be another civil war. Another one is that Hezbollah will take over completely and uh, will uh, lead uh, Lebanon completely. The third one is continue, continuous of deterioration. The only optimistic one is about the possibility that some kind of help from outside and also from inside, from the leadership of, uh, of Lebanon, uh, will come and maybe we'll start some uh, uh, optimistic uh, direction to change uh, what's happening uh, in uh, Lebanon. I'll conclude with a simple message. I think a simple message to the um, uh, decision makers in Israel and I think for the leaders in the international community. Uh, the message is don't give up on Lebanon. Don't let Lebanon fall in the hands completely in the hands of Hezbollah and Iran. Because this is the very bad scenario that we, we are seeing here in, uh, in Israel, and I think that this is what everybody has to be uh, afraid of. And we have to be more proactive. We have to, uh, to, pro uh, to have some common uh, strategy to see how we can help the population of Lebanon uh, without letting Hezbollah uh, taking this assistance and putting it in its pockets uh, or in, into its uh, advantage, how we can uh, strengthen the uh, opponents of Hezbollah in Lebanon and to continue with the uh, pressure uh, on, uh, on uh, Hezbollah. Okay, your concluding remarks. So I would like to conclude with uh, uh, three uh, comments. Uh, one is uh, optimistic. In a way, this, this is a horrible economic downturn. Uh, it was term, uh, termed by the World Bank as one of the uh, three worst uh, uh, economic uh, collapses in the last, uh, since 1850 in the world. But this, this crisis uh, took place without a war. So in a way, no capital was dis uh, destroyed. The bridges are there, the roads are there, the hospitals are there. So I hope that with a change in the system, perhaps economic recovery could take place much faster than in the case after wars where you need to rebuild the capital. The pessimist uh, comment is uh, we are facing uh, a change in the financial situation, in the global financial situation, and interest rates are likely to go up particularly in the US, but also in other countries, other uh, leading countries. And Lebanon is deeply in, with debts. So increase of uh, interest rates uh, are bad news for uh, all countries with large debt, and particularly for Lebanon. And the last comment is, um, I'm trying to think about the situation that Tony again uh, describes that Hezbollah is actually take, took over Lebanon, and, and now it's not what is called in political science a roving bandit. It's, it's a stationary bandit. So if they want to increase uh, their benefits for themselves uh, from controlling Lebanon, they should uh, be uh, able to push for development of Lebanon, uh, which could, could also benefit other actors, not only Hezbollah itself. Thank you. And Tony, the last words are, are yours. So I think the situation is going to continue, uh, the system is going to continue to limp along. The system in its current incarnation, meaning uh, a Hezbollah-dominated system, the, 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 um, the rise, if you like, of political Shiism under the domination of Hezbollah, that's going to continue. Um, the country is going to continue to limp along uh, as it has been for the last two years, and more likely the desperation of outside actors is going to win out, and uh, except for the Saudis, I don't see the Saudis coming in, and that is the right decision, by the way. I mean, they they understand. They are the only ones with the realistic assessment. 
uh, the French are going to continue to rely on the United States to provide capital, and the United States will continue to provide low capital. Uh, so that will help Lebanon continue to limp along uh, the way it has been uh, uh, it has been for the last two years. Now, the, the, that is the irrelevant part, because domestic Lebanese dynamics are really not important. Uh, what is going to make a difference in how uh, the, what comes next with Lebanon and, and certainly within Lebanese-Israeli relations is if the United States does conclude uh, uh, a deal with the Iranians the way it, we are seeing it in the trajectory that we're seeing, which means that there's going to be a lifting of sanctions, which means that there's going to be enriching uh, of uh, Iran, which also is going to obviously trickle down to Hezbollah one way or another, uh, which will help Incidentally, Hezbollah uh, managed uh, to, you know, to, to get the country to limp along and to perhaps even consolidate uh, its uh, explicit partnership with France and its uh, unofficial partnership with the Biden administration. Uh, so that, of course, presents a different dilemma for Israel because a, an unleashed Iran, uh, you know, then Israel has a decision whether it coexists with that, or if it takes preemptive action. Of course, I don't presume to talk about that, but that is the, the, the that will become the decision point. And of course, it will become a military issue, and that's the bottom line, because the political dynamics of Lebanon are not really of any relevance to anyone, <laughs> except for the Lebanese themselves. So I think the fork in the road is going to come uh, once the the Biden team and the crew from the Obama team uh, conclude what they had started in 2013 and 2015 uh, and, and uh, sort of relaunch this uh, uh, realignment, as I've called it, with, with the Iranians. And that, of course, is going to be the most meaningful uh, change uh, in the, in the uh, sort of geopolitical dynamics affecting Israel moving forward. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Haggai. Thank you, Orna. Uh, I'm joining Orna with the message of don't give up on Lebanon. We're going to go to the next one, and then we'll talk about the security of the Lebanon. Thank you.